So the question that, that many, many of us ask, and I'll often ask you when you come to my office, does your shoulder bother you? And you're, you're here today, so probably it does. But when the shoulder bothers you, patients are often a little alarmed or curious. They say, no, it's my arm or my elbow or pain that radiates along my arm. And where these two individuals are grabbing or holding their arm is the distribution of where the shoulder actually hurts, in the back and in the front, radiating down along the deltoid muscle. The shoulder can really interfere uh, or allow you to do your activities of daily living in a proper way. So combing your hair, something as simple as putting your wallet in your pocket by reaching behind or sleeping at night can be activities that are disrupted by shoulder pain or shoulder-related injuries. Sometimes the shoulder can keep you from doing the activities that you really like. Playing tennis, particularly patients who serve, will come in and tell me, gosh, I can hit my ground strokes, but I can't serve as well as I'd like to. Flying a kite, reaching up overhead are one of the more common stories about reaching back in your car to grab something or other things that patients will commonly tell me bother their shoulder. Shoulders can bother you a lot at night. A compromised shoulder can lead to compromised function and weakness or the inability to reach into the refrigerator, grab a gallon of milk, or do the things that you like to do normally. Sometimes it can be a combination of both weakness and loss of function. When I evaluate a patient for the shoulder, one of the first things I want to do is make sure this pain is indeed coming from their shoulder and not coming from their neck or a pinched nerve, which can often have an overlap with the shoulder. When you come into my office, I'll first examine you. One of the things that's commonly painful is reaching up overhead. So as I take this patient's arm and I lift it up over her head, the very top range of motion is where it really bothers her the most. Another test I can frequently do is reach across the body. And as this individual reaches across at the very top range of motion, this can become painful. And these are symptoms or signs of shoulder impingement, which I'll discuss and describe in a moment. I'm going to test for strength and see what kind of strength or compromise of strength that the individual may have. And then I want to test for strength in different planes of motion. So not just overhead, but at the side and in different things that can affect your activities of daily living. By manipulating the arm into different positions, I can actually isolate the muscles of the rotator cuff and often figure out what the problem is just by examining you. And I'll use other tests to confirm or to make my diagnosis that much more accurate. The other tests that we get are x-rays, and routinely when you come into the office for a shoulder examination, I'll get x-rays. X-rays will help me determine whether or not there's the presence or absence of arthritis, whether or not there are bone spurs in your shoulder, or calcium deposits. Sometimes I'll move along to using an MRI scan. An MRI will allow me to understand what the quality of the tendons and the soft tissue are. So while an x-ray tells me about the bone, the MRI tells me about the tendons and the soft tissue of the shoulder. We're now moving into an era where ultrasound may be useful. We can sometimes do ultrasound immediately in the office and get immediate information. The information may not always be as accurate as what's seen in an MRI scan, but I think the conjunction of the two can help lead to a very accurate understanding and depiction of what's happening in the shoulder joint. So some of the things that we'll talk about in causes of pain and compromised function include a shoulder fracture, a shoulder dislocation, rotator cuff disease, which is what I'll focus on the most, and then arthritis, what Dr. Miller will focus on in the second half of this talk. Just looking at the normal anatomy, the ball and the socket, the shoulder is not exactly the same ball and socket that you have in a hip. It's a little less constrained, and the less constraint is what allows the arm to move around more freely than your hip. And there's a ball called the humerus and the socket called the glenoid. And those are the important things that we'll talk about. The rotator cuff, not cup, cuff is a group of four muscles. And these muscles come together or coalesce together to form a cuff of tissue. And this is where the name comes from. Those four muscles include the supraspinatus muscle, which is probably the one that we talk about most and the one that's most frequently injured. The infraspinatus muscle, the teres minor, and then the muscle in the front called the subscapularis. When I look at these at the time of surgery, however, they all come together and look like an even cuff or sheet of tissue, and hence this is where the name rotator cuff comes from. One of the common problems that we see are fractures. As the winter comes and the floor gets slippery and we get ice on the ground, you can slip and fall and land on your shoulder. The shoulder can fracture, and typically the ball fractures. Although we can see socket or glenoid fractures, they're less common than the fractures in the, in, the, in, the, in the ball or in the humerus. 
Hopefully, most of these fractures are not shifted or displaced or in the wrong position, and we're able to treat these in a non-operative fashion, which would mean wearing a sling and then attending physical therapy afterwards. Unfortunately, as you can see in this x-ray here, on the left-hand side is a shoulder, and remembering back to the earlier, the earlier image where the ball is nice and round, in this image here, the ball is tilted back, the head is tilted back, and the shoulder is really in the wrong position. Left untreated, this can really progress to a rapid arthritis and loss of function and pain. So not only will the shoulder not move, but it'd be very painful. In this situation, the person has to have surgery, and what we'll do is put a plate, a plate and screws. And here you can see a plate applied to the outside of the arm with screws that hold the pieces of the humerus back together again. This reestablishes the congruity of the joint, and then the individual can be expected to move their arm and really not have pain afterwards. A shoulder dislocation is another thing that's, uh, that I'll often see patients for. Typically, again, you're coming downstairs or have a slip and fall and the shoulder pops out of joint. In an office, uh, or rather in a, a visit to the emergency room where the emergency room can put the shoulder back into place can usually be the, the end of the treatment. However, as the body gets older, the tissues become more stiff and over age 40, when the shoulder dislocates, we have to be concerned or at least alerted to the possibility of a rotator cuff tear. Thank you. And that'll lead to the, 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 the last part or the part that I enjoy talking about the most, the rotator cuff disease or abnormality. Remembering what the shoulder looks like, here we can see a shoulder and the rotator cuff is this tissue over here. This tissue can tear away from the bone and that's where it usually happens. The tissue tears away from the bone and when it tears away from the bone, it can lead to loss of function and pain. This pain is, is significant at night. This pain is significant when you try to do increasing level of activities, whether your activity is lifting your arm up overhead to clear out the cupboard or playing competitive tennis, the overhead function with a torn rotator cuff can really become compromised and uncomfortable. One of the things that can happen in the absence of a complete tear is the term impingement. An impingement of the shoulder happens when the arm is lifted above the head and the bone of the shoulder here called the acromion and the bone of the, so of the ball and socket called the humerus can pinch the tissues in between. One of those tissues is called the bursa and the bursa has a normal and important job. The bursa applies lubrication and nutrition for an otherwise healthy rotator cuff. When the cuff is injured or the bursa is inflamed, this tissue can pinch and the overhead motion can become very, very painful. This can often be the consequence or lead to tendonitis or inflammation. We'll take an x-ray at this point and sometimes see a bone spur. And here you can see a bone spur that could act like a little ice pick that would help pinch or make that tissue feel worse. The rotator cuff and the impingement may happen just because the tendon is actually just wear and tear as our body ages. Sometimes the spur can really make it happen worse. Sometimes you can do activities such as throwing a ball repetitively. If you were a high school or a college level athlete and did a repetitive activity, it could lead to this. And then there could be trauma, the slip and fall that has led to the pain that, lead, that leads to rotator cuffs. Unfortunately, the single most in fa important factor contributing to tearing the rotator cuff is the aging body. And that's something that we're doing. A, we're trying hard to stop, and we just can't figure out how to stop that just yet. <laughs> Patients will frequently ask me, can I treat this non-operatively, and will the rotator cuff heal? Does it have any capacity to heal? Do small tears necessarily turn into larger tears? And since the early 1930s, I think we've realized that this tissue does not really have a tremendous capacity to heal on its own. And these studies have been repeated in the 30s and the 40s again in 1990 and 2000, trying hopefully with our better technology to understand what the natural history of a rotator cuff tear is. And unfortunately, we have not figured out any tricky ways to make this heal without surgery. That being said, how do we manage the pain? Does everybody need surgery? And can we manage the pain of a rotator cuff tear in different ways? And the answer is yes, absolutely. In certain situations, we can lifestyle change. We can avoid certain activities that are very provocative to the shoulder. Physical therapy. Physical therapy can actually help patients with defined rotator cuff tears. By strengthening the surrounding muscles in the shoulder, we can sometimes lead to better function without pain. 
So not everybody with a rotator cuff tear needs to have surgery. And in certain instances, physical therapy may be the first line of treatment that we try in order to avoid surgery. Medications such as anti-inflammatory medication can be useful, but over long periods of time, those medications can be dangerous to your stomach, liver, and kidneys, and we want your medical doctor to follow you very closely for these types of things. Finally, injections, injections into the joint using different materials as lidocaine and cortisone or even platelets at times have been shown to relieve the pain, sometimes temporarily and sometimes in a significant enough way to prevent surgery. So indeed, there are non-surgical options that should be explored in many patients prior to looking into rotator cuff surgery. Surgery, uh, however, is a useful solution and a predictable solution for those individuals who have failed and been unable to get better from non-surgical methods. And the surgery has really advanced a lot from this picture on the left where they're still trying to figure out how to fix the rotator cuff in the late uh, 1890s to today where we do it arthroscopically. And I would venture to say that well over 99% of rotator cuff surgery that we do currently is done through the arthroscope in a minimally invasive way. This cartoon, hopefully it plays slow enough, but what it shows you initially is a torn rotator cuff that we can reattach using stitches and devices called suture anchors. And I'll show you a, another, uh, some more detail. I, I like to show the, the gore of surgery. And here you can see a live, a live surgery. And on the left-hand side is this tissue torn away from the bone. So that is a rotator cuff tear. The first thing that we'll do in surgery is actually prepare or clean away the bone so that I can take away any tissue that would interfere with healing. And I want to do everything in my power to maximize the healing. So I'm going to create a healthy bed of tissue for this torn rotator cuff to attach to. And uh, it's amazing to look at this because you say, gosh, there's, there's no blood. Well, we try to do this in a, in a uh, bloodless fashion. And this is actually real time in the same way that I see it. Another comment is, gosh, this is so clear. And yes, it is clear. We create small channels in the bone. And these small channels in the bone, and this device is a little smaller than a pencil, the small channels in the bone are what we can put the screws or the suture anchors into. And here you can see a tap, just the same tap that you might use in carpentry. We're going to uh, sometimes <laughs> tap the bone. I'll tell you about some other cool surgery tricks, too. We'll create a nice socket so we can have a very machine socket and put this, this screw or this anchor into the bone. This anchor, uh, and as time has gone on, these anchors have turned into very exciting materials. This anchor can actually turn to bone in your body and really disappear over time, which is pretty amazing. Uh, historically, they were made out of metal and different substances. And when I remove the driver or the screwdriver, I have stitches. So this is the magic of how I stitch something into a bone. And then I'm able to reach in with these different devices and grab a bite of the tissue and within the shoulder, pass the stitch through the tendon. So here we go. The secrets of building a ship in the bottle are being given away. Don't try this at home, please. <laughs> and I'll grasp the stitch and pull it out of the way. And here you can see how I can pass the stitch through the tendon in your shoulder through tiny little poke holes and actually stitch the tendon back down to bone. And I'll shuttle it out of the way. And I'll repeat this sequence as many as eight or ten times uh, until I have enough stitches in the exact right uh, reduction of tissue. This fancy medical device that I'm going to take the stitch out with, you see there, is a, it's a crochet hook. I did not borrow from my grandmother knitting. We use our own. And uh, I'll repeat the sequence of steps. This is a... Uh, that's really led us to generation one of rotator cuff repair. And in the top left corner, you can see a tendon that's stitched down to the bone with multiple knots and stitches. One of the things we've been proud of doing over the last seven years together uh, at the ONS shoulder team and so shoulder and sports team is trying to understand the technology, trying to advance the technology and the science of this. We've gone from straightforward single row rotator cuff repairs to double row rotator cuff repairs where we use more, more sutures and more anchors to finally now where we anatomically repair this back down into place. And what I'm going to show you is what we consider the state of the art. And the state of the art has been for at least the last five or six years what we're doing. So here you're seeing a rotator cuff repaired back down into place. But instead of the single row, we do what's called a bridge of tissue. And this bridge of tissue has been shown in cadaver models to be stronger and better. And in a study that we published in the Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery, we were able to show higher healing rates. So we're actually able to, able to 
allow patients to heal better through better technology, which I think is very exciting. And that's something that we really try very hard at the foundation to understand and, and do better at. And here you can see it almost looks prettier and looks neater how perfectly this is laid back down into place. The results of this, well, the first thing is that after surgery, uh, which is a hard part perhaps for the surgeons, but the easy part for the patient, because you just get to sit there, you wear a sling between four and six weeks. Three months of physical therapy, so it's a real commitment on the patient's standpoint to getting better. However, with well-done surgery and, and, and a well-done physical therapy, you can expect a 95% or better success rate in the ability to go back to overhead sports, tennis and the like, or fly fishing, or whatever it is that you like, and certainly, most patients are going to have an expected resolution of their pain. Some of the unique things that we can do at the ONS service is we offer dual surgeons. Um, and I didn't really think a lot of this for many years until I recognized it. Most centers are going, to have a, are going to be a teaching center and teach a resident or a fellow, which is very important and very useful. And I'm the product of such an environment. But at ONS, we're able to have two surgeons who work on the shoulder at any given time. And there's a group of five of us who do this, and really the healthy interaction uh, with two doctors who are board certified and fellowship trained in one area offers a huge advantage to you as a patient in understanding this. And this is actually, uh, this is today's surgery. This is what I did before coming downstairs today. What's new? Patients like to ask me, what's exciting and new? What's, what new technology are you facing? Last year, we talked a lot about the use of platelets and platelet injections in rotator cuff surgery. Platelets probably uh, are not as helpful to the rotator cuff healing as we'd like to think. Uh, current studies are showing us. But we're trying to use your own body's growth factors. And in this picture on the left, I'm showing you little vents that we make in the bone. And these vents or these small holes that we make in the bone release your body's own growth factor and your body's own stem cells into the area that we're trying to heal. And this may be the next exciting frontier. Eventually, we'd like to isolate and grow these same growth factors and inject them into your body. But for now, we're trying very hard to use your own growth factors. Another thing that's become very exciting is a patch. And on the right-hand side of these images, you can see a patch of tissue. And in individuals who have very badly torn tissue or very weak tissue, or for those individuals who've had recurrent surgery, we will sometimes patch the rotator cuff. And by patching the rotator cuff, we can increase the strength of the repair and perhaps allow that individual to heal up in a more expeditious or at least predictable fashion. And that's what we really want. We want you to heal and do well in a predictable fashion.